So, uh, thank you very, very much for this exposition. <laughs> it was uh, really uh, smashing uh, with a lot of issues uh, addressed. So, can I ask uh, who wants to take the floor immediately? Yeah, please, with uh, solutions. You have the floor. Uh, I, I don't have many solutions. I just want to refer to Barbara Tuckman's March of Folly, which starts as a first chapter with <coughs> the stupidity of government, uh, the king of Troy uh, letting in the horse, and he shouldn't have known that. The, um, uh, I was a bit involved in, uh, in, the, in the Euro crisis, and a lot of what we did had to do with governance, mm -hmm. governance inside the European Union, that is. We, uh, for instance, we transferred a lot of powers from the capitals <coughs> to Brussels as far as fiscal discipline is concerned, and we transferred a lot of national powers to the central bank as far as <coughs> um, um, uh, super, um, prudential supervision was concerned. Now, I thought about that when uh, Professor Frieden was referring to <coughs> new socio-political socio models. And I was wondering whether we are thinking enough about something which may seem too far-fetched given the fact that multilateralism is going down, uh, <coughs> down a slippery slope anyway, but that we shouldn't think uh, a bit more about what instruments we can build, we could build, we could build over time to try and make sure that the, the, the policies one country is following is not harming and hurting too much the uh, uh, other countries. That's the basic line we have inside the European Union. The economic policy of an individual country is considered to be a matter of common interest. You cannot do, even if you, and if you did, it turns against you like it was the case in Ireland. So I would like to, to know, <coughs> Professor Frieden, whether there is any thinking on the governance side of uh, all the uh, uh, crises and catastrophes which uh, are looming over us. Thank you. Thank you. I ask the, the speakers to take note of uh, questions which uh, they are addressed. Thank you very much indeed. Other issues? Please. Uh, Jean-Claude, you started by saying that uh, you were concerned about um, the world economy now and the prospect of a new crisis, but you didn't explain uh, why. Uh, I wonder if you could do that. Uh, but let me ask a very uninformed American question, um, which has to do with your assessment that a key to resolving some of the current European problems, Euro problems, lies in Germany and inflation. Um, could you explain that and uh, tell us why they won't do it? Uh, <laughs> Part of your questions uh, is only echoing my own interrogation on Japan and, uh, and uh, Germany and perhaps the Netherlands uh, countries uh, where the unions in particular, the labor force, is uh, so keen, rightly so, to reach uh, full employment and not take any risk on full employment that finally you don't have what you would have expected at a certain level of uh, heating or overheating, namely the real demand coming from the, the labor force. Uh, in a way, this is a phenomenon that we are observing in all countries, but it is particularly acute, it seems to me, in certain culture, and in certain culture which are at the level of full employment and where everybody uh, in the social uh, fabric likes very much to stay and doesn't want to take any risk. I must confess myself, I made a mistake on, on the German uh, fabric because I thought that at a certain level of full employment, then you would have this kind of uh, request for uh, augmentation of wages and salaries that would augment unit labor costs, that would have, that would permit Germany to be back to, I would say, a more normal level of inflation, taking into account the current account surplus of 8% of GDP and, and, and and would permit them to be back to their traditional yearly inflation or the, during the 40 years before the euro, which was significantly higher than what we are observing since we have the euro. So my, my own response provisional would be, we are in a situation first 
where, again, unions in general and the labor force considers that the wage restraints were extraordinarily effective and efficient in getting full employment. And, and that before changing their own behavior, uh, they would uh, reflect a lot, and they are still reflecting in, in some respect. A second explanation, which is also new, and uh, I uh, am reflecting on that since, uh, say, two years, is that we were perhaps under-assessing labor mobility inside the euro area. We observed much more uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italian going in Germany than we would have expected. And you know that the main criticism of the euro area at the very beginning was you, you will not have this labor mobility which exists in the US and you will be hampered by that. The, the paradox is that we had not much labor mobility at the start and that in the crisis, because of the crisis, we are perhaps observing a high level of labor mobility. I, I'm, I was struck by the fact that it looks like 300,000 workers coming from the euro area came in Germany in, 50, in year 15. That, that was not expected, frankly speaking. And of course, it's such a big influx of uh, new labor that you can understand that it weakens considerably the demand of the German citizens that are themselves uh, working uh, in, in the labor force. So th that's for, for, for your second question. Your, your first question was not, was different. Yeah, why I am worrying. <laughs> well, uh, we, <laughs> as you could see, it is a sentiment which is quite generalized, obviously. If I would concentrate on only three elements, say three, in order not to embark on eight and nine or whatever, because you, you can go very far. Uh, first, I am struck by the fact that we still have augmentation of financial leverage at the global level. There are different met methodology, different computation. I myself uh, chaired uh, the G30. I'm still an honorary chairman of the G30. We produce a report which was clearly signaling, but it was two or three years ago, that the pace of additional outstanding debt, public and private, at a global level, as a percentage of global GDP, had continued after the crisis, more or less at the same pace as before the crisis. Might not be exactly the same now. Uh, the IMF has worked a lot on that and produced figures that are different from the figures we had. The idea, nevertheless, that it, it continued to, to go on uh, in, at the global level is still there. Another element which uh, is, of course, uh, a little bit intriguing is that the epicenter of the crisis was in the advanced economy and the advanced economy have deleveraged a little bit in uh, some of them at least uh, substantially other less substantially in the private sector but apart from a very few cases they continue to augment leverage in the public sector in the public finance sector and so all taken into account, I would say that the pace of additional uh, debt outstanding, public and private, as a percentage of GDP, which was 90% before the crisis of the augmentation of debt outstanding, is now only 50%. So you could say, if, if the pace is the same, it is a big diminishing uh, by a factor two of uh, their contribution to global leverage, financial leverage. If you take the emerging economies and all the other economies, then they had a contribution of 10% and it's now 50%. So it has been multiplied by five. And of course, China is a case in point because we, we see a very big augmentation of uh, debt outstanding, uh, particularly, I have to say, uh, in the private sector or so-called private sector with an explosion uh, in particularly of corporate bonds. But all, all that taken into account, of course, signals something which is very unhealthy, namely that we did not draw the lessons from the fact that the crisis was, one of the major dimensions of the crisis was over-leveraging. And uh, I would uh, fully echo what has been said on Fisher and, uh, and also on Minsky. <laughs> we, we have there elements that are worrying. Second, second uh, uh, element, 
of course, asset inflation that we have observed in a number of countries, and of course, particularly in the United States of America, so a correction will happen. Uh, Jean-Claude is uh, particularly, uh, I would say, worrying on that. Uh, I think that uh, many, uh, many very good uh, American economists are also particularly uh, uh, worrying, I have to say, and uh, Martin Feldstein in particular uh, regularly says, oh, 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 something will happen. Of course, it never happens at a time that you can predict. So when you continue to make money out of the increase of uh, the assets uh, that you have on the, on the uh, share and stocks markets, uh, you, you appear as a stupid guy <laughs> if you disinvest or if you uh, give good advice to your clients. Uh, but at the time, uh, these, these advices will be good. <laughs> but that, that's uh, what we all, always observe. A last point, which is not to be neglected, is that uh, in the cycle, we are in a number of countries 10 years after the start of the recovery. We had counter-cyclical uh, measures that were taken in a number of countries, particularly in the United States of America. So this is not good in terms of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, smoothing uh, the, the cycle. Uh, it, it amplifies the possible cycle, particularly when time comes for a recession. And of course, when the recession comes, as has been said, you have very meager remunerations as regards both the monetary policy, I have to say particularly in Japan and in Europe, but also in the US in many respects, where normally they, they, they say, I'm speaking under the control of eminent economists, that they would need 5% decrease of interest rates to have something which would be significant to combat the recession, and, and they are not there. And it's very unlikely that they would be there uh, when time comes. And of course, the fiscal, the, the, you know, the fiscal element in countering the crisis is not there either. And uh, only a very few countries in the world can say we have room for maneuvering. So you see, all these elements, but I, I'm only stick to those three, are not putting me in a situation to be very optimistic, obviously. So thank you very much for your question. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, speakers can intervene any time huh, if they think uh, appropriate. Uh, I have Renaud and then you. Okay. Uh, should I understand from this session that um, there was too much quantitative easing from the Fed and um, from the cent uh, European Central Bank, which is a kind of, kind of quantitative easing, that's my first question. And my second question is, can we consider that for the, this crisis that you are all more or less predicting us, uh, quantitative easing would not be an efficient tool? Maybe we could take note of this question and then the speakers will respond and take the last uh, question in that batch of the uh, first uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the uh, workshop, so I may have missed some of the things. Uh, coming from my perspective, I'm a banker. I've been a banker for many years. I'm still in financial services. I work for European banks and American banks. And my sense, I've lived through many financial crises, including in the last financial crisis. And one of the things that struck me is that, of course, there was a lot of leverage in financial institutions at the beginning of the, so the, the case of Lehman is obvious. There was a, a leverage of 50 or 40 to 50, so which is, now things have improved a lot, particularly for American bank. I would say it's fair to say that American banks are probably better capitalized than European banks on average. But having said that, don't you think that we are in a situation where regulation has been implemented, Dodd-Frank nevertheless has some shortcomings and weaknesses, there's been an attempt to reform, and my sense would be, because you're looking for solution, don't you think that if we want to reduce the burden of some of the regulation, we have to increase the capitalization of banks? And recently, I had the opportunity of listening to Alan Greenspan, who was speaking to the Economic Club in New York. And Alan Greenspan was making the case that we probably need to be in a safe situation. And we're talking of regulated institutions, but also, obviously, the comment that has been made about shadow banking is very pertinent. And, and 
absolutely adequate. Don't you think that the leverage, which is now probably, I mean, the capitalization of banks is about 10%. Now, we say 10, 11, 12%, depending for the Cyprus, it can be up to 12%. Don't you think that we can request 15 and perhaps 20% to be in a safer environment to be able to take care of all the problems that will come up at some point? It's a good question. Uh, in Europe, I think we are uh, approximately at 14%, if I take the significant financial institution. In the US, it's higher, it seems to me. Anyway, thank you very much. Then we have several questions, and perhaps we can make a tour de table. So uh, in the order of, uh, of intervention, perhaps, uh, can I uh, ask each speaker whether he has any comment to make or any response to, to bring uh, to, to, uh, to the questions we had? You have the floor. I, I answered the question regarding the, the, the quantitative easing. Um, I still think uh, maybe um, uh, QE created a lot of uh, problems, particularly uh, some, as someone uh, claim the QE take, uh, take care of Wall Street first then take care of Main Street later. That means uh, uh, using quote other people say is a, is a classical logic. But at least um, QE makes sense to uh, save the uh, whole financial crisis uh, from totally collapsing. Uh, in that sense, I guess, for example, in, in China, um, we don't see, uh, don't, um, uh, define the stimulus uh, package uh, in 2009 as a QE, but actually it is a, the total money China put uh, occupied 12% of GDP of China, much more than uh, US. I guess US money total per, per is 9% of uh, US GDP, but in some way uh, it, it, it is working. Although they create lots of uh, uh, negative problem, but I don't think there's a, another better way to deal with these kind of uh, systematic uh, uh, collapse. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. So can I, can I turn to uh, Jean-Claude now? How would you respond? Maybe I can comment on uh, Renaud's question about quantitative easing. Yeah. You would better do so than, than me. But uh, I think it has, been, it has been a very good thing. It has been a miracle that has been invented with this quantitative easing, both in the United States and in Europe. The problem is when, we stop, when you stop it, it's a kind of drug. You, know, you have a drug and then you stop your opium and then you, are, you feel very bad. That's the question we raise. Uh, which we can raise today, when we stop it, especially when the things are not very good, because again, we must not uh, then smoke opium today. Things are not good today. There's a lack of trust, there's an anxiety. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote my paper uh, beginning, end of September, beginning of October, wrote it, drafted. Well, 10 days after, markets, 10% less. So t tomorrow, I don't uh, not tomorrow because the markets are closed. But Monday, I don't know. Uh, uh, we are in a we are we are in a, we are in a new world now. The end, in a way, in a way, I must say, from a moral viewpoint, it's quite good because it has been obscene to see the stock market going up every day by one percent. Uh, with people with 1% being extremely rich and the rest of the population which has, who has no stock, stocks in his pocket being poorer and poorer. Thank you. Um, I turn to Jeff. A lot to comment on. I'll try to focus on some of the more political or political economy issues. Just, I have to say on the quantitative easing, to me, the crucial lesson I take away from obviously from the economics, if I agree with what's been said. The crucial point that I would take away is that this was um, a result of the unwillingness or inability of governments to engage in a sufficient fiscal stimulus. And the fact that the relatively independent central banks 
took all, carried all the water pretty much for the recovery indicates the very weak political bases that we have for confronting the problems that arise. We should have had a much bigger stimulus in the US and European policy was pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. So, so I think that tells us something about the, be the beginnings of the understanding of the political failures that we've seen. I wanted to start, not start, I wanted to address particularly the point about global governance, which after all is the, the, the uh, dilemma or the slogan of the, of the meeting, um, there is a very clear normative view, very straightforward. Just as when financial markets went from local to national, there are public goods associated with financial markets, whether it's Lebanon or last resort facilities, financial stability in itself is a public good, and so we got national financial institutions that provided the public good of financial stability. We have global financial markets today. There's clearly a demand for some, something resembling global public goods provision in the international financial system. Some could argue that to some extent it's been provided by cooperation at the level of the G7 or the G20. Uh, some could argue that it's been provided, some aspect of lender of last resort facilities provided by the IMF, augmented by by national governments. So there's a clear normative argument for something that we would call global governance in the financial system as in elsewhere. But the financial system is particularly striking both because the theoretical underpinnings of understanding why there's a need for public goods provision in finance are very strong. Um, and also I would say that to some extent it's gone farther in finance than anywhere else. If you had asked me 25 years ago, would there be this level of cooperation at the regulatory level with Basel or at, in, in, with, the, with the fund, with bailouts, with, uh, with uh, programs and monetary policy cooperation, all this, I would have probably said no, no way. So there's been more progress made. The problem is that for the continued provision of those global public goods or even something resembling global public goods, there has to be domestic political support. People are not going to support government policies that are aimed at some abstract, ethereal notion of global financial stability, first, if they don't see that it's going to help them, and second, if they believe that it's going to hurt them, which they do. As an example, some of you may remember that there was massive opposition in the U.S. to the bank bailouts, not the bank bailouts, but the sovereign debt bailouts of the 1990s, such that there were a whole series of laws passed which seriously hamstring the ability of the Fed and the Treasury to engage in, in these packages. The sponsor of both significant legislations was Bernie Sanders. Right. And he has continued to make the argument that American involvement in these packages is against the interests of, of, of the American people. And Donald Trump doesn't have that sophistication, but if he did, and his people do, they will make the same argument. And this is directly relevant, actually, to Jim's point, or to the question there that, that Jim asked about Germany. And, and the, the point is not that, that countries malignantly decide to impose costs on other countries. Right? It's that they're concerned legitimately with their own political, economic, and social well-being. The Germans did not continue to run massive surpluses at a time when they should have been spending them down and running deficits. I mean, the, the old line is that the problem of Europe in the crisis was German economic thinking, which said that every country in Europe should run surpluses with Germany, and Germany should run surpluses with every country in Europe. Uh, obviously unsustainable, but, but it didn't come from some bloody-mindedness on the part of the German people. It came, as Jean-Claude was saying, I, I'd say some people, there are arguments in the literature about why. Some people think that essentially it's an unholy alliance of exporters and the elderly in Germany, uh, insisting on low wages and low inflation, but you could talk about national cultures as well. The point is that German economic policy is driven by the demands of the German people. And if you can't get in an integrated, in, in, as play, in, a, in a region as integrated as Europe, where Germans support European integration, if you can't get a commitment to do something that is essential for the prosperity of other members of the Eurozone out of the German people, then the underlying problem of what is the domestic political support for that kind of global cooperation or global, public, global government's going to look like. It, it did not look good in the crisis. It does not look good now. 
we face more difficulties, and we now have political movements that are, in some cases, very, very explicitly opposed to anything that looks like global cooperation. I want to mention one more thing, because people have been talking about leverage. I think leverage is always an important issue. To me, it's, it's not leverage per se, but where it is, who it will harm, and how it will be addressed. And people talk about the emerging markets. I think the, that there's a crucial fact about leverage in the emerging markets that has gotten far too little attention. The big story of the last 15 years in the emerging markets is that for the first time in modern history, sovereigns can borrow in their own currency. Right? So there's the old original sin argument. That original sin has somehow been atoned for. So Peru sells all of its government debt to foreign funds. So sovereigns are borrowing in local currency. But the private sector is borrowing ex almost exclusively in foreign currency. And so when a government faces, let's imagine a government, let's call it Argentina, that faces a crisis, that Argentina actually is a case where no one was doing any borrowing, so it doesn't come up. Let's say a crisis like the Argentine crisis happens to Peru, and the government finds that its only way out is to substantially devalue the soul. It's not going to hurt government finances, because government, li government liabil liabilities are our own solace. It's going to bankrupt the private sector. And that's going to be the political challenge that the emerging markets are going to face, and by ex extension that the financial system is going to face when these countries start, start facing difficulties. It's going to be a rerun of the 80s on steroids. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chef. I see that, no, 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 uh, I'm continuing the speakers tour de table. Uh, they have to, <laughs> to respond. So uh, it's uh, Daniel turns. I think that one could try to answer at the surface. I, I shouldn't say superficially, but uh, taking it as a working hypothesis that the basically, basically the system should stay as it is, but we have to I shouldn't say we tinker on the fringes, but if we raise capital ratio, I mean, uh, more capital. And Mati and Helvig have been saying for years that banks need to have much more of a cushion of own capital that banks do not have. And why? Because the system in itself, the way it's been constructed over the years, starting with uh, uh, the 70s, a major decision of, of the American administration, uh, the Nixon administration, has been increasingly destabilizing. I mean, financial markets are, have been increasingly destabilizing economies. And, and, and one could argue that the, the, the global system is overfinanced. Overfinanced. And, and finance has been extracting rents. Something has to be done about it. But so this is why there are people, and but we, we're not discussing it almost at all. Like Mervyn King and others, turn turn on the air. We are saying there is something terribly wrong with the basics of the system. We have to change the system, but that this is very tough. It's like it's like repairing the, airpl the airplane. What is the solution? Why the airplane? <laughs> no, no, I'm telling you the solution. I, I'll tell you what I think should be done. Um, when it comes to, um, to the euro area, because you mentioned, I think we have to complete the banking union. The banking union, if it is to be completed, has to deal with the fiscal arrangements. There is no other way. A collective deposit insurance scheme boils down to fiscal arrangements. You could call it fiscal integration. You could say not fiscal integration, but it is a fiscal arrangement which means basically mutualizing risks. Germany, I, I don't see Germany accepting it. If, if it's not done, we'll have an extremely fragile banking union. And, and I think it is a must. It has to be done. Otherwise... You're more optimistic than, than yourself, but we will see. No, I, I think it has to be done. I mean, you ask me what I think should be done, and I think it should be done. Sure. Secondly, and this is what Olivier said this morning, uh, I mean, this afternoon, he said, and, and Germany is also, I mean, it's, uh, it's also to be pointed out at, is, is the policy stance. 
Germany is fond of saying rules have to be observed. I mean, we have to, to play by the rules. Okay. But Germany has never accepted that such a big current account surplus has to be addressed. And that's also a rule. I mean, as the Commission have been saying for years. I mean, the limit is, is 6%. I mean, so, so this also has to be addressed. I believe that banks, in spite of being better capitalized, I think banks should have more capital. They should be. They should be more robust. <coughs> Relatedly, I have, we have to deal with the non-banks. Non-banks have to be tightly regulated. Many of them, they call themselves non-banks, I mean, but they operate like banks. They have to be regulated, the non-banks. I mean, we cannot allow such a, a big uh, a loophole. Policy coordination, Jeff said, no way, and I, I agree. G20 was capable of doing something. Now, it's much tougher nowadays because of the erosion of multilateralism, and we see it's not happening in the euro area as it, it should. But we, we, we just, we can't accept it. We have to work hard and, and, and do something in terms of policy coordination. Otherwise, we are doomed. And, and, and in addition, the example of Japan. We cannot clone Japan. We cannot say, uh, I mean, the rest of the world is not like Japan. It may, part of the rest of the world may turn into other Japans when it comes to uh, how many residents uh, hold uh, uh, public debt and, um, and saving and so on and so on. So, so that the system should be much more resilient because there is resilience in the Japanese system. But other, other parts of the, world are, are, of the world are not Japan. Okay, it's a good transition. <laughs> you have the floor. I have uh, three comments. One on financial crisis, second is on QE, and third is a point which I didn't make, which is related to targeted inflation. Now, because I'm from Japan, I know very well about uh, earthquake. It is very difficult to predict earthquake. It is impossible to stop earthquake. So what we are thinking about is how we can just respond after earthquake happen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you use that metaphor, can you predict when financial crisis is coming? Or can you stop financial crisis? Hopefully, but not. So even prudence policy, uh, mostly is how we can just re react in good way after just the financial crisis coming. So, uh, yes, it is better if we don't have financial crisis. Maybe the second best is smaller financial crisis. And then it should come more. I mean, small earthquake is coming more, then we can just uh, have less large amount of earthquake. Now, I have a very good observation of the Korean financial crisis in 1997. It was, it's very bad when I saw the economy. But if you look at the data, say, five years later or 10 years later, Korean economy just you know, recovered very nicely. So you cannot identify very big <laughs> uh, bad effects of the financial crisis just by looking at the data for 10 years. So I think resilience or just how we can recover from fiscal uh, financial crisis, it, it, it may be probably more important. Now, second QE, I think uh, I just uh, echo to just the chairman's point, just uh, because interest rate is so low, zero for us, if we have uh, some kind of a very big shock, it is almost impossible to just respond by interest rate policy. So the only remaining policy is quantitative policy and fiscal policy. So in that respect, maybe quantitative policy uh, will be, become more important when there's some kind of financial crisis. Now, important thing is quantitative expansion is not only just expansion of balance sheet. And there's a, the other aspect, that is what you are going to buy. You can buy government bond, or you can buy some kind of just the, the asset of, from stock market, or you can buy from foreign exchange market. Now, if uh, Japan buys something from foreign exchange market, maybe Mr. Trump will be very angry, so I don't know whether it's politically easy or not. But uh, the stock price, for example, uh, stock market may be very interesting uh, way to inject the money. And also, uh, when the uh, financial crisis happen, uh, or the economy is not very good, uh, fiscal policy uh, in some type is very important. I like uh, this, when bank has some kind of problem, capital injection, uh, 
uh, may be very important, and uh, that that may help. The the just uh, negative impact will be softened. The th last point, which I didn't mention, but related to the point just uh, uh, was mentioned, just uh, the debt GDP ratio. Now, Japan debt GDP ratio is probably around 200 percent. Or it depends on how you just measure the debt. And of course, we need to just have a, some kind of balancing of deficit. Deficit should be maybe be below 3% or 2%. But even though we have uh, just uh, the zero deficit uh, from some time, but still that 200% cannot be decreased without increasing nominal GDP. Mm. Now, well, it's maybe very good if we can have achieve a very high growth rate. But unfortunately, real growth rate or potential growth rate is not very high because TFP is not good. So the only solution. Demographics are the concern. Oh, yeah. So the only solution is just inflation. So not very high inflation, 2% or 3% inflation help a lot because most of the that's accumulated debt for Japan did not come from aging. It just came uh, from just deflation and de shrinking tax revenue because of the economic uh, slump. So, so I think uh, the, the where inflation targeting should be set is very important not only just because for the short-term problem, but more the long-term problem. And it was very much related to the fiscal consolidation problem. Although I'm sure, I know, it's not very easy to achieve mm. higher inflation rate. Thank you. Lo looks difficult, obviously. <laughs> okay, thank you, Moto uh, I turn to Bertrand. Yes, the privilege of being last, I, I will try to be short. Uh, four, four little comments. First, I will echo what you just said, Jeff. Uh, you have two issues with debt, is, is the level and what is it used for. And as I said, we could have used this period of low interest rates to prepare the future, and we have not. Right? Not enough, at least. And that's, that's part of the issue. So the, the quantitative element is obviously absolutely crucial. But if at least it would have been used to do something great, that would have been a different story. Uh, a second point. Uh, to, echo, to, to answer the, the question of Jean-Claude on, on, on banks, it's precisely the points I've made. Again, we, we are back to focusing on different pieces of the puzzle instead of focusing on the holistic perspective of the puzzle. I, I think the ratio of banks are okay today. I mean, you can discuss whether here and there. I think we have to finish the, the banking union. Then we started, we still have differences in the financing of economies. I mean, this was one of the issues before the crisis when people argue that in the US the markets are leading and in Europe it's banks and China is different, China, Japan is different. It's, it has not really changed. So we had the, the marvelous slogan of the capital market union in Europe, which I, as far as I know is still a magnific magnificent slogan, but there is no reality behind it. So we have not really address that, that, that issue. So I think we really need to, to, to move back to a holistic approach. What do we need to finance this economy? I mean, how do we value equity invest investment versus debt investment? We have not discussed that. Uh, how do we mobilize money for infrastructure? How do we mobilize money for the long term, etc.? We have not addressed that. The rules have not changed. We, not, nothing. That's my third element. It's more a malicious comment, but not that malicious on quantitative easing. Why never, did we never discuss green quantitative easing? It would have been an interesting occasion to allocate part of the money channeled into uh, buying bonds specific to green. Why not? Target. Target. I know central bank. I have this conversation with Benoit actually, who is more open than you, Jean Claude. I think it was worth discussing. I think it was worth discussing. Uh, and last on Germany, I'm from. Yeah, I cannot help uh, intervening. <laughs> then you will have. All, absolutely all, uh, social uh, and uh, no, know, very highly praised investment that will come Yeah, but to the you. difference is that, that, we, that we, I mean, uh, now with the U.S. outside, everybody has signed on COP21. It's a global engagement signed by heads of state. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a and kind of... fight against inequality and uh, better education for everybody. Uh, you, I mean, you buy 100 billion of, of, of yeah. green bonds, etc. I mean, it's, it's at least worth discussing. I, I do that only to... No, of course, but I think it, I, yes, I said it was malicious, but I think to have at least this conversation would have been interesting, even to talk to the population, actually, not just to have this technical discussion between bankers. And my last point on, on, on Germany, uh, I love Germany, I come from Alsace, I have, I have really uh, considered Rhine not as a, uh, as a border, but as, as a way to cross a passage, a bridge. My only concern when, when we discuss with German and when they, they add the high moral, uh, I do say, high, and the moral high ground in the conversation. 
it's not necessarily just rational, everything you discuss, but we are right because we are right. Uh, and that's, that's really where it's, it, it's, it's a little difficult. I mean, that's, again, I say that, I'm, I'm not, not participating to anything, I've left Europe six years ago, but I feel that every time I go to Germany, I presented my book a few weeks ago, and it was so, mag I mean, obvious in the room, I couldn't believe it. Thank you. Well, I, d I disagree also <laughs> with you on that point, but we, we, will, we will discuss that later. So, thank you very much. We have still something like uh, 25 minutes, and I think that we have a lot of uh, discussion to take place. So, I will interrupt uh, both, I would say, questioner and responders in order to be sure that we uh, are exploiting uh, our ideas. You have the floor, sir. <sighs> I'm going to do this with great trepidation, <clears throat> but I want to build on something that Jeff introduced and Bernard took further. The way humans behave <clears throat> is to develop a set of heuristics and then apply them consistently until the system fails. And when we develop models for the purpose of modeling for simulations and related things, that's what we do once again. So simulations work brilliantly as long as the underlying assumptions associated with the simulation are effective and the moment those underlying conditions are no longer replicable, the simulation breaks down. That's how society functions too. <clears throat> that's why we have revolutions from time to time. There's a significant change in respect of social, economic, and technological circumstances, and the institutional response to it is inadequate. Jean-Claude has made the point, I think, wonderfully in the past, that in effect, the central bankers who had to grapple with the crisis in 2008 did not have textbooks did not have recently published articles that they could easily refer to, and in effect, they had to make policy on the hoof. And that's why I guess we refer to it as unconventional monetary policy even today. But the fact of the matter is policy frequently has unintended consequences, and some of those are what we're grappling with in respect of both the unintended consequences of extreme liquidity, on the one hand, and the issues that we haven't addressed as a consequence of the crisis on the other. Now, there's nothing surprising about that. That's what human systems do. But I think what we're failing to recognize in a certain sense is the system around the technical system is broken. We're not getting the rise of people from Duterte to Trump, from Putin to Erdogan, from Bolsonaro to everything else, because of the fact that unconventional monetary policy produced too much liquidity in the system. We are getting that response because the level of trust within society and the political institutions and the economic manifestations of those institutions, including monetary policy, but it's a relatively small part of the whole, no longer are seen by significant segments of many populations as serving a purpose. Now that's the vulnerability, it seems to me, within which we will have to face the next financial crisis, great or small. And the potential for escalation in conditions where social cohesion has broken down dramatically, social polarization has increased highly significantly, trust in institutions has been appreciably reduced, it's going to be far more difficult to come up with technical solutions to technical problems under those particular circumstances. So unless we use this moment to drive that debate forward, what we are properly discussing in this workshop this afternoon is going to prove likely to be impossible. The trust that you could rely on, Jean-Claude, back when, in 2008, doesn't exist today. Bundeskanzler Merkel may not be the CDU leader in January of 2019. The Hessen result is probably going to cause a further loss of roughly 10% to the CDU. The Bavarian result produced a similar loss in respect to the CSU. 
and the pressure that exists in respect of all of the centrist parties in the European space, before you get to Russia, Turkey, the Philippines and Brazil, the pressure that exists on those centrist parties whence our norms come, whence that normative framework within which we are expected to deploy fiscal and monetary policy in order to bring about a restoration of stability is fracturing. And that, I think, is the most frightening element of the present moment. It's not something that too many people around this table can deal with directly, but I think it would be a serious mistake to imagine that technical instruments are going to be adequate to deal with the next crisis. No, you're absolutely right. I think there is a consensus to consider that populism, the new wave of populism, is something which is now the main challenge for all, I would say, political, uh, part, political parties, leaders, and so forth, everywhere, finally, including in a country which is succeeding admirably in terms of employment, in terms of, uh, of uh, cohesion of the society, at least uh, seen from the outside, and still the governmental parties are uh, vanishing. In my own country, it's a caricature. Uh, we, we have, uh, fortunately, it's not the extremists that are taking over, but it is the, a new centrist uh, that you know, is totally eliminating, and it's a real, real issue, the traditional right and the traditional left. So thank you very much, but uh, okay, we, we all agree that it's the problem, and of course it's a political problem, uh, which cannot have technical response. But, the technicians have nevertheless to, to bring about the best possible solution, taking into account. My, my own interpretation, but I don't want to monopolize the, the response, is that uh, we have this problem probably for the next 30 or 40 years, because it, the, the, I would say, most vulnerable part of the population in the advanced economy, the working class, uh, less educated than the best, uh, I would say, member of uh, part of the labor force, will have the competition of India, Brazil, Mexico, China, and the like, and Indonesia, and so forth, for the next 30 or 40 years. And until and the they. Post yeah, yeah, on, on, top, on top of that, plus the changes of values that they observe in society, which makes this anxiety gigantic because it's an economic uh, anxiety. It's, uh, I would say, obsolescence of uh, skills and it's also a change of value. So uh, I think we, we have to tell political uh, leaders uh, and uh, parties of all persuasion that they have a structural problem which is really gigantic uh, and they have to, to think uh, boldly uh, in this respect. And again, it's not for, uh, for us, unfortunately, to give the appropriate response. But um, I uh, think that maybe we could take two or three new uh, questions and then we could wrap up. Uh, let me take all the questionnaires. Yes, madame, you have the floor. Madame, you have the floor. The, oh, no, it's not you. It, yeah. you. Uh, you go, go? No, no, okay. the, the first is madame. Yes, thank you. And then you, and then do we have other questions? Uh, no? Two questions now, or remarks, or observation. Right. Or well, I'll share my you observation, and I have a question. You um, have the floor. You, thank you for yeah. uh, bringing a discussion back to emerging market economy. And uh, Jean-Claude, and Jean-Claude, you um, uh, talked about the rising, uncomfortably rising levels of uh, debt, um, including and particularly in emerging market um, economies. What um, I worry about as a um, sovereign debt restructuring um, um, practitioner um, in particular is uh, the the quality of, of, of the debt and the components of, of such levels of debt and particular non Paris club bilateral indebtedness um, which is uh, kind of obscured at, at the moment but it will rise as a as a new problem uh, from my perspective um, just having been in that space for for over 20 years so how would non traditional bilateral creditors like China and India would respond uh, when um, their sovereign debtors cannot repay um, their loans and it will happen. They will not be able to repay their loans. So I see three options. One is 
negotiating um, ad hoc arrangements, uh, perhaps securing political or uh, geopolitical concessions um, as a price um, of uh, forgiveness of such loan. Option two is uh, um, joining Paris Club, um, and uh, option three is forming a new club, such as, uh, you know, a, say, a Beijing Club of uh, non-OECD um, uh, members. So far, um, for example, you know, China, um, the, um, the, the, the major uh, principal lender in emerging market um, has dealt, uh, you know, with uh, the situation using the first option, negotiating um, ad hoc arrangements. Um, just uh, earlier this year, and we, we uh, touched briefly about it in, in, uh, in, in the panels, you know, China secured 99% um, of, uh, of the major port in Sri Lanka, plus 15, um, thousand um, acres of adjacent land, a very strategic um, place, uh, piece, um, in uh, exchange for debt relief, for total debt relief uh, of uh, Sri Lanka as a sovereign. Would uh, um, Venezuela and Ecuador be the next uh, contenders in uh, you know, using the same, um, the same option? Um, I hope not. So, you know, what would uh, be, you know, the governance issue, um, you know, the governance solution uh, for that issue? So I will be thinking about that. I'm just curious what uh, panelists uh, thought about that. Thank you very much, madam. It's a real question. You have the floor, and then you, sir. Please, madam. Um, I was just going to try and go back to the real economy for a moment um, and talk a little bit about growth. So one of the things that concerned me a bit when I was in the Treasury Department was a putting out a, a number like 3% um, when you know your labor force is growing at 0.3 or 0.4 you're putting a huge amount of faith in productivity growth, um, which is, of course, right, the key to long-term growth in per capita income and, and what we really, in a long-term sense, are all seeking. So I think my question is really, is there a role for finance in supporting, improving, fostering productivity growth? Has, or has finance been part of the problem? Um, so sometimes you hear, um, the story that, you know, QE and uh, extraordinary liquidity has essentially propped up very low productivity firms for a very long time. It, we really haven't had this kind of creative destruction that we normally have um, during recessions, but this one was just so terrifying that we just had to put a floor in there and uh, a lot of people were supported. Um, you also hear, or I've heard, um, that because we're in a more IT and IP uh, intensive environment, some of that's a little bit harder to collateralize. And so financials are having a harder time lending to those firms or understanding the, the way in which to lend to those firms. So I'd just be curious from the people in the room whether you think finance is part of the problem and also part of the solution, if there are things that should be changing. Thank you very, very much indeed. So the last question, if I may, and then we will uh, try to wrap up. Please. Yeah, um, I come from Germany, <coughs> therefore it took me a while to, <laughs> you, take, to take the current you heard a lot. Of my question. <laughs> um, there is no government policy to create a trade surplus. So what do you want the Germans to do? And I, I know Mr. Schäuble always uh, talks about the Schwabian housewife who only spends the money that you have previously earned. What do you want them to do? So uh, we maybe, uh, I will not make a, a tour de table in order to, to be sure that those of us that have a response to bring about would, would do that. And we have a lot of new questions and observations, uh, and I, I reserve my right to, to respond also to some of them. But uh, who wants to speak now? Jeff, have you? <laughs> no, there was a lot of questions which are of a political nature. Right. And, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> the simple one on the German front is fiscal policy. Um, fiscal policy, and then uh, the German government plays a role directly or indirectly in wage negotiations um, and and has has been I mean well it's been it's, it's been back and forth but I think the two things that have been pointed to the first is would would be undertaking a more expansionary fiscal policy and the second will be 
trying to encourage a loosening of some of the wage restraint that was so central in the early 2000s, but is now, now counter, uh, counterproductive, I think. Um, I think that in many ways, one of the most interesting, one of the most interesting questions is the one that was raised about what China will do when it ha when its debtors start going under. Um, we do have, as you say, the the Sri Lanka precedent, which is a is really a debt to equity conversion. You know, uh, in this case, the equity being <laughs> some pretty important, yeah, <laughs> 99 year lease on some pretty on some things which some people believe are are centrally uh, important to, to Sri Lankan national security. Um, and since the amounts involved are very large relative to the country's economies, I think that it will raise a whole series of political questions. And China may well find itself in the crosshairs of some nationalist, it already has in Sri Lanka, but may find itself in the crosshairs of, of some pretty powerful nationalist sentiment, which might mean that it might want to join the Paris Club or talk with the fund about structured uh, re about that restructuring under the auspices of the fund. I think it would be foolish for the Chinese, I, this is not advice, but it, it is advice, but it's, it's free advice, so worth what it's paid for. Um, it would be foolish of the Chinese, I think, to maintain these things on a bilateral, bilateral basis because the history is that they always become politicized and always in a bad way for the creditor. Um, I think yours is the crucial question, if we only knew why productivity was slowing down, we could do something about that. Um, I do, I am struck by the fact that no one has addressed the, I, I want to call it hypothesis, I think it's a fact, but the hypothesis that even today in many countries, especially in Europe, the credit channel is fundamentally restricted or not functioning fully. Um, there's a lot of evidence, we have bank bank firm loan specific data for Portugal, for example, that shows that small and medium enter enterprises today still cannot raise all the funds that they need to, which goes back to the, the potential misallocation of resources even with zero interest rates. When the credit channel is impeded, that means that good projects don't get funded. Um, I think that actually is also true in the U.S., although not to the level of, of, uh, of Europe, because there were so many bad loans on the books and there's so much risk aversion in the private sector, um, that good, good, good projects are not being funded. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I think that would be part of it, would be looking at the, the impede, impediment, the impediments to the credit channel. Thank you very, very much indeed. You want to yeah. say a word, please? I just uh, may I comment on just yeah. a possible role of finance to just raise productivity and uh, growth. And it may be related to also the current account surplus problem. Now, looking at the Japanese case, uh, the so-called investment saving, saving investment difference divided by GDP is 5.5% in the last 10 years. <laughs> so which means just corporate sector, I'm interested in the corporate sector, corporate sector is accumulating about 60% of GDP for the last 10 years. They don't spend, they didn't spend. Now, in order to just to mobilize the economy from supply side, I think investment is very critical not only just for expansion of the capability, more important thing is how they can change business model under the innovation. So in the case of Japan, this is very important. So government tried to just to stimulate, just, to, just moving money, which is already there, which is not used, <laughs> to the more active uh, action to the corporate sectors. Now, in German case, the saving investment difference divided by GDP is something like 2.6%. So it may be better than us. I mean, you save less, but still, that part, if it can be used to just stimulate the economy uh, for supply side chain, that may be more collection of the current account. I don't know how the government policy can just uh, uh, move that, but uh, I, I think the anyway, see, saving investment uh, difference in corporate sector is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, I'm going to address the, the debt, uh, debt issue uh, from a little bit broad um, uh, perspective. Um, I recall um, 40 years ago when China started to um, uh, open door or economic reform, they are also facing uh, the financing uh, issue. Uh, fortunately, at that time I recall there's a, um, 
uh, debt crisis in Latin America. So China uh, facing, you borrow money uh, abroad or you do uh, FTI, attract foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, China is taking second uh, measurement, uh, which I think is successful. Also, I guess I just read the, uh, the book um, called 329 Days, uh, I guess wrote by the uh, personal ad advisor for former uh, Prime Minister Ko. Uh, the 329 Days called the collapse of the Berlin Wall to the unification of German. When I finished reading the book, I suddenly recognized why Soviet Union failed in some way, because I guess at the last, um, they make a phone call, call, call Gorbachev. They're talking about money, mm -hmm. talking about how much money uh, uh, Western Germany to give the, the Soviet Union to get agreement from Soviet Union to have a unification of Germany. So in Soviet Union also get lots of falling uh, debt mm. to support their uh, uh, economic reform. True. So that's the issue. Also back to the current uh, situation, I guess still a developing country can do some regulation on private uh, borrowing, uh, overseas borrowing. Maybe that's not totally capital account uh, opening, but after the uh, global financial system, IMF will literally changing their position, allow in some way capital control still in the part of the tool of a potential uh, management. So in that way, for example, currently China, if private company want to borrow money overseas, they have to get approved from Chinese government. That way China can control uh, the falling debt for private. Sovereign debt, of course, is a separate issue. It's relatively uh, can be controlled. Thank you very much indeed. So very rapidly, perhaps if you wish, uh, Bertrand and Daniel. Two, two, uh, two quick comments. First, I w I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, I, I would really emphasize what you said. I said if by any chance after for the next crisis, Odysseus and Hector came to a good technical solution, it would be a very hard sell. And that's, that I think, a big issue. And so I'm afraid we will repeat the curse of the war of Troy. That's uh, not to add to a positive note to this end. Second point, as finance being part of the problem, uh, just one, one, one element, if my memory is correct, the highest weight of finance in GDP in the US and UK was 1929 and 2007. So I think it was part of the problem. Uh, and now one of the issues after everything which has been put in place is that finance uh, is really echoing the lack of trust in the system Again, I mentioned compliance, but the, the bureaucracy, etc. So it takes much more time to do things. It's much more complex. It's a drain on the economy. And if I take a tiny bit, which where I spend a lot of time when I was at the World Bank, which is correspond banking, it's below the radar, but it's just disappearing day after day after day. So it's basically the relationship between emerging and developing economies and the central system, which was handled by Citigroup, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank. One after the other, they cut the ties. That will be a problem for the global economy, which is not visible yet, but someday it will surface, and then we have another problem and another backlash from the population. Uh, let's keep in mind uh, about China. China in particular has been um, behind, has been behind creating alternative arrangements to the Bretton Woods arrangements. It's happening in Asia and many countries have joined this. So I would use this as an analogy for, you, you said the Beijing group. I don't know if it's going to be called, it could be Kuala Lumpur group, or it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. Clearly it's going to happen. And not, uh, they, we should not believe that the guys in, in Beijing do not understand, I mean, it's uh, the pitfalls. Okay. Now, secondly, about Germany. Uh, why Germany has to think about the policy stance. If Germany had had its own currency nowadays, I mean, it's, the euro is like an undervalued Deutsche Bank. When it comes to competitiveness and the industrial strength of the German economy, I mean, it's a, uh, Germany would have experience with a much stronger currency, a lot more unemployment, 
Uh, so, so, so this is something people should understand, and, is, and it's the task of politicians in Germany to explain it, however unpalatable it is, is for German citizens. Last but not least about finance. It may be that there is a lot which is wrong with finance. And, and finance is not like a bakery. Finance has a particular role to play. It could, it could argue that finance has many of the attributes of public utilities. So if, if, if finance is frozen nowadays when it comes to reshaping, it's redirecting its funding of activities, so on and so on. Now, in Germany, there's the Kredit für Wiederaubau. We're talking nowadays in Europe about promoting promotional banks. I think we should, we should set up a range of banks with the backing of the, of the governments. We should fund new, new industries. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck. There is so much risk aversion, I mean, there is so much fear, then there should be something you go, yes, this is government intervention. This, I mean, give me a break. I mean, well, it's like a Kriegswirtschaft. I mean, it's a, and, and there are promotional banks in Europe, in Germany, in Austria, even France. I mean, the, 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 the French government is behind, I mean, banks. So we should not fear it. I mean, it, it is such an extraordinary set of circumstances, and we should be bold. So I would not fear setting up, even in, in the United States, there is talk about setting up such a public finance institution. Why not? What, what, what's wrong with this? I think it, it, if we are blinded by ideology, we're going to, to continue to go in the wrong direction. We should be pragmatic. Thank you. Uh, in the US, you have Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which are semi-public institutions, are uh, taking a lot of risk and are preventing the banks, the commercial banks, from taking a lot of risk that are taken in Europe by the banks themselves. So we, we, we are in a very complex situation as regards the financing of the economy on both sides of the Atlantic. If I may uh, try to wrap up, first of all, we had a very good discussion, obviously, a lot of interaction. Uh, I cannot help uh, saying a word on, on Germany. Uh, the problem of Germany is really twofold. One is the very big current account surplus, which is signaling something which is not absolutely uh, normal. That being said, I uh, share the view of Wolfgang uh, when he says, but, but uh, what do you want me to do finally? I don't commend the industry and the entrepreneurs. I don't commend the unions. They have their own deal. All what we could do is to encourage the union to be more demanding, which was done by the German government and by the president of the Bundesbank.